Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, my name is Eric Shorey. I live in Lisbon Falls, Maine. I'm married with three children. I have a degree in mechanical engineering and work as an engineering supervisor for a company that makes dampers, gas turbine exhaust systems, and expansion joints for the power industry. I'm also a licensed professional engineer. I'm a member of the Wales Brethren Church in Wales, Maine, where I serve as a deacon. I've been a believer in Jesus Christ for almost 22 years and a member of the Wales Church for almost 14 years. It's my task this morning to describe to you what it's like growing up not knowing Jesus. The purpose of doing so is not to draw out your pity or to play on your emotions. The goal in sharing this is simply to help you understand the principles and worldview that governed my life before Jesus. This may help you as you interact with others who grew up not knowing Jesus. My upbringing is far from the most tragic you will hear about, yet there are plenty of pain, disappointment, and longing for better circumstances. It's through these circumstances that God prepared my heart and mind to receive His Son as Savior and Lord. In the first half of my presentation, I will share an abbreviated story of my life before Jesus. This story is going to focus on what was happening in my, in my life, the circumstances that I faced, and how I responded to them. This will serve as the framework for the second half of my presentation, which will focus on my guiding principles and worldview before Christ. I'll start by saying I was not physically or sexually abused, so I don't carry that baggage. Also, I didn't, know, I didn't knowingly live in rebellion to God, fear of future judgment, or hell, or hope of heaven. For half of my life, religious instruction and practice in my family and my own personal life did not exist. There was no, personal, there was no childhood baptism, or attending Easter or Christmas services. There are no prayers with mom and dad, or talks about who God was. I can recall only one early childhood memory that might count as exposure to re religious ideas. I remember looking at pictures in a book of locusts and people with boils all over them that I thought were Egyptian. I can remember it because the, the people looked terrified by what was happening. It was never explained to me, nor do I remember reading the captions or surrounding paragraphs to understand that these Pictures were from the biblical account of the plagues of Egypt. It was only after I became a Christian that I understood what those pictures were about. Childhood. I was born before either of my parents graduated high school, both under the age of 18. In fact, my mother never attended high school at all. My father dropped out before he graduated, just prior to graduation. He later earned his GED, they married after finding about a, out about the pregnancy, but this was not the beginning of a happily ever after story. The upbringing my mother received had not prepared her to raise a child of her own or to be a wife. She was the second youngest of 13 children and was mostly neglected. However, her mother did take time to teach her how to abuse alcohol at a young age, at a very young age. My father watched his parents Marriage fall apart due to alcohol abuse. But that experience that he learned there was not used to prevent this possible outcome in his own marriage. Alcohol and drugs soon became a major part of his life, and things quickly got out of control. However, before things went too far, my father decided to join the Air Force and try to force some discipline into his life before completely destroying himself and his family. Shortly after joining the Air Force, they had their second son. Almost two years had passed since I was born, and things were not getting easier. My mother had two children, and she had not even celebrated her 18th birthday yet. Partying and drinking with friends provided the desired relief from the stress of raising two boys, both under the age of two. These habits continued for some time, and with them came financial troubles and difficulty raising their two children. My father eventually gave up his drinking and partying in order to turn his life around. He could see that his children needed him, and he decided to change. However, my mother would not give up her habits that she had come to depend on. 
that gave her a way of escape from the painful reality of her life and the situation that she was in. Before getting discharged from the Air Force, they had their third and final son. It had been a five, five tough years since I was born. Thankfully, I was too young to realize all that had and was happening. All I knew is that I was happy to have two other brothers to play with. I can't recall memories of my father's drinking and partying, but I can for my mom. As I grew older, I became aware of my mother's addictions and worried about her safety. Many nights I would wait up for mom to come home, worried that she'd be killed in a drunk driving accident. I could not understand why she would do this to herself and to her family. I could see that the drinking and the drugs changed her attitude and love toward the family. She eventually put all priorities below her need for drugs and alcohol and destroyed the relationship with her husband and with her children. My father showed as much love as he could to us kids while dealing with his own pain. My father made many sacrifices, including his own happiness, to keep the family together. He spent time coaching and teaching us how to play many sports. As time went on, we children became heavily involved in sports and replaced some of the sadness at home with success and friendships on the ball fields. Through this, we grew closer to our father and more distant from our mother. I remember feeling betrayed by my mother and vowed to be nothing like her. Even though I had had a hard time recalling them, I'm sure there were thought positive things that my mother taught me. However, the most prominent thing I learned from my mother is what not to do with one's life. My second encounter with religious ideas came sometime during middle school. I can remember going over to the Open Door Bible Church for Sunday school. This would have been an independent Baptist church. My brothers and I, one of my brothers and I, would be picked up by a school bus in front of our house and taken over for Sunday school without our parents. During Sunday school, the children were called upon to answer questions from Bible stories, but we had no clue what they were talking about. After the classroom time was over, we were brought over to a gym for sports. The time came at the gym did keep our, our interest. This time at the, at the gym did keep our interest for a while, but eventually convinced our parents to stop making us go. Of the time we spent at Open Door Bible Church, I can't remember anything of a religious nature from it. I can remember being there. But that's about it. High school. In high school, I followed close in my parents' footsteps. I too fell in love with a teenage girl and had a son when I was a junior in high school. The cycle started over again. Neither of us were prepared to raise a child, much like my parents over 16 years earlier. My girlfriend dropped out of high school, but she would later go back for her diploma. However, one habit that we did not continue was that of alcohol and drug abuse. I found comfort and love in my girlfriend. She became the only person I could trust, and I needed her deeply. With her, I felt safe. I also had friends and sports to ease some of the pain of home life, and despite the home atmosphere, I was excelling academically and athletically. My third encounter with religious ideas came during high school. I remember feeling left out when my friends were going through catechism, which is Catholic instruction before coming, becoming a communicant. However, I felt left out. I didn't feel left out enough to try it, to get into what they were doing. I was too busy with schoolwork, sports, work, friends, and taking care of my young child. I can also remember being asked what religion I was. I didn't know how to answer. What religion should I be? What determines your religion? Is that something you were born with or inherit from your parents? During my senior year, home life grew worse and finally ended with my parents divorcing. Even though I was disappointed in my mother, I loved her and did not want her out of the family. My father had found another woman to love and be loved by, and he wanted to start over. My mother, on the other hand, wanted to take care of me and my brothers. My mother was, had no means to do so. Her addictions kept her from performing her responsibilities as a mother. So after the divorce, she moved out and for a while lost contact with my brothers and me. Despite these circumstances, I did not drop out of high school. I found comfort and love in my girlfriend, 
and a reason to do better than my parents had done before me. I started thinking about my own future, what was best for my son and my girlfriend. My grades and SAT scores were sufficient for getting into college, but I also considered joining the Air Force like my father had done. In the end, I chose college so I could earn a degree and hopefully get a good paying job. This decision put additional stress on the relationship with my girlfriend and trying to figure out our future together. Paying for college and supporting a family didn't seem feasible, but I thought it would work out somehow. I loved my girlfriend very much and promised to marry her, but I had not learned how to show this to her properly. I was hurting inside and vented my pain and anger toward her, not in a physically abusive way, but in words, attitudes, actions. She finally decided she had had enough and needed to find someone who would love her and treat her better. She could not see how we were going to make it no matter what decision we made about the future. I could not believe that she could leave me too. My world was closing in around me and nothing was in place to stop it. There was no place to call home, literally, and no one to comfort me at this time. As I left high school behind me, I was leaving with my parents' marriage recently ending, my girlfriend breaking up with me, and my sports career over. Everything that I had throughout high school to give me meaning and a feeling of belonging disintegrated right in front of my eyes. I thought, how could this happen? Everything had been going so well, or so I thought. What does this mean? What am I going to do now? Little did I know that God was already at work in my life to bring good out of hopelessness and despair, even though I didn't know him. College. College picked up just where high school had ended. I felt alone and depressed, with nowhere to turn to soothe the pain. All of my sources of emotional support were no longer there for me to lean on. Instead of my parents calling to find out how I was doing, my mother would call for money or wouldn't call at all. Birthdays and holidays were only a source of pain, so I avoided their celebration. Country music became my greatest comfort and my young son the driving motivation behind enduring college. The rest of my family was not faring any better. One of my brothers had been abandoned in an apartment to cook, clean, and care for himself. My mother was homeless and had been checked into a hospital for trying to commit suicide. My youngest brother was brought into a home of his father's new wife and was, not, was only slightly better than the home life he had just left. In this new home, he was not shown love or acceptance, and that would affect him for many years into the future. The first half of my college experience was mostly a depressing and emotional trying time in my life. My parents were in no shape to comfort me, and my friends didn't understand enough of what was going on to be of any help. No love was coming from anywhere. I was all alone. What I wanted was someone to fill the hole in my heart, which was emptied very rapidly and without my approval. What I didn't know was that someone would be Jesus. My fourth and continuing in encounter with religious ideas started with a guy named John who lived in the dorm room right next to mine. He was a quiet, soft-spoken guy who was in the same major as me. He was projected to graduate the same year as I, so we saw each other in the same classes. Hi was mostly all the words we exchanged during my freshman year. Early in the first semester of my sophomore year, my roommate and I had a party. To our surprise, John from next door came over. This was unlike anything I thought John would ever do. His actions and words were unlike any ones I had ever observed before, and attending a party did not seem to fit. Although I didn't know why he was different, I liked the fact that he didn't just follow the crowd. During our party, party John and I started talking about some of our classes together, and to my surprise, we had a lot of things to talk about. This was the start of a meaningful friendship. 
We got to know each other better through our classes and meals at the dining hall. John was the right person I needed to tell me about the message that God had for me. John was as intelligent, if not more so than I, athletic, into outdoor activities, honest, and respectful. Our personalities meshed perfectly. I don't specifically remember John telling me about Jesus at first, but he didn't need to. His life spoke volumes. His attitude towards life, his subtle points about sin, and his genuine care for others. He also gave me a Bible and encouraged me to read it. So as I left in the spring of my sophomore year, things started changing in me, and I didn't know where they were headed. That summer, I worked at a, a GE in Auburn, Maine as a summer intern. I was assigned a task that involved making some calculations and predictions for some of their production processes, and I got a chance to put some of these to the test. After bouncing around some of the other production lines for a brief time, I spent an extended time at Line 8 performing experiments. Line 8 was operated by a guy named Carl. During my many days at Line 8, we somehow got on the topic of religion and God. We undertook many discussions about God. I don't remember most of the questions asked or answers given, but they had interested me to find out more. One line of questioning I do remember was about supernatural things God was doing in Carl's life or in others' lives. What I think I can glean from this line of questioning is that I had picked up from somewhere that God does unexplainable things. Does God show himself to you? Have you ever seen his face? Things of that nature. While I don't remember what he told me, it got me thinking about God nonetheless. Not having been taught anything about God, nothing seemed unreasonable for me to ask. I was free to discover God just as he had created me to do by asking questions. Carl also encouraged me to start listening to a Christian radio station, even though I, that's not, I didn't know what that was at that time. I was specifically pointed to a program that started at 6 in the morning. That was a perfect time because I left the house at about 6 and work started at 6.30. The 6 o'clock time slot on this radio station was filled with a program called Love Worth Finding. This program was done by a pastor named, named Adrian Rogers of the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. And I tuned in not knowing what I was in for. Adrian Rogers talked a lot about who God is and who Jesus is. I remember being captivated from the first moment I started listening and thirsted for more every time it was over. I wasn't thirsting for the rhetoric of Adrian Rogers, but the message of love from God. Almost every time I turned it on, he would be talking about something in my life I was having problems with. Feelings of guilt, and hopelessness, and not being understood or loved. Along with the explanation of problems I could relate with, was a message that somebody loved me more than I could ever know. I didn't understand the meaning of that right then in my life, but a few months, but in a few months, things would be very clear as to what that meant. Just before returning to school in the fall of 1999, I stopped in my dad's house for a visit. While I was there, he, we watched a movie called Left Behind. This movie was adapted from the Left Behind book series. Being unfamiliar with the Bible and Revelation in particular, this was very intriguing to me. Is there really going to be a final judgment? Will people be left behind? More importantly, will I be left behind? These are some pretty serious questions. What is going to happen to me? Is there a way I can find out? With these questions in mind, I started my junior year not knowing my life would be changed forever. John and I picked up from where we had left off in the spring of my sophomore year, spending more time doing homework and projects, and this time discussing God as well. Finding people to share concerns and questions with is pretty easy at college because most people routinely are sharing concerns about exams and homework. It seemed logical to begin sharing other concerns with John. At that point, it started becoming clear there were other pressing matters in my life that needed attention, and not just exams. 
As the first se semester pressed on, so did my questioning about God. On my frequent trips home from college, I can remember being com comforted by the message on the Christian radio station. Dr. Adrian Rogers has started a series called Meeting Jesus at the Crossroads of Life. It is at this time that I learned who Jesus was and what he had done for me. How he came, that we may have life, we may have it more abundantly. How God clothed himself in human flesh, how he experienced humanity and temptations. How he performed miracles and taught with authority. How he corrected and forgave, how he served, how he loved how he was mocked and ridiculed, how he was beaten, how he was led off to hang on a tree of shame, how he forgave even in the midst of agony, how he rose from the grave in victory, and how he changed lives and history forever. He did everything I needed to ensure I was not left behind. Having realized for myself how much I needed him and how much he loved me, Together with the help of the Holy Spirit, I put my faith in Him. In my car on the way to work during Thanksgiving break, I asked for forgiveness and invited Him into my life. I received a new life, a new direction, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they filled the emptiness inside. That was almost 20 years ago that Jesus revealed Himself to me. I experienced real change in my life that I could not completely understand. Many of the desires I once had were beginning to be replaced with the desires to know Him better, desires to please Him and walk with Him. My response was, try, was to try to be obedient. After all Jesus had done for me, the least I could do was try to be obedient and follow His instruction for my life. Ever since that time, I've been thirsting for the Word and desiring to love Him. I could end my testimony here and it would have covered my life growing up not knowing Jesus. However, I'd like to continue the story to help briefly explain how he came into Anabaptist circles. Shiloh Chapel was the only church in the area that I knew of, and so I attended reluctantly at first. After listening to many programs on Christian radio about how a believer needs to be involved with a church, I finally got up enough courage to go to church. I sat upstairs in the balcony of Shiloh Chapel with a lot of people I didn't know and who didn't know me. I attended by myself regularly and tried to sing songs that were extremely foreign but full of amazing truth. As time passed, I felt like I needed to be a part of the church, not just an attendee. So I started sitting downstairs and felt more a part of the service. As more time passed, I eventually got to know some people and felt like I was accepted into the body of Christ. One last thing that I knew I wanted to take care of was baptism. So on Easter 2002, I was baptized by the pastor of the church. It was at this church that I received the sincere milk of the word and grew spiritually. It was there that I learned the principles of the doctrines of Christ, such as repentance, faith, baptism, laying on of hands, the resurrection, and eternal judgment. I tasted that the Lord was gracious, and for a time I was happy and content with milk. During the season of growth, I met a Christian girl who attended this church, and we fell in love and got married. She had a Christian heritage and Christian parents who were both members of the church. It was a real blessing to have someone with which to share and to talk about all the things I had learned as a child of God, and was still learning as a child of God. As time passed, I continued to grow thanks to the preaching and teaching of the Word and my regular reading of the Word. I desired to grow and become everything that the Bible challenged me to be. I loved my Savior and did not want to disappoint Him. I believed the Word of God and desired to live by everything it demanded of me, no matter how difficult it seemed to be. I had a hunger and thirst for righteousness that I earnestly sought to fulfill in my own life. I knew that my life should be lived differently now that I was a child of God. I longed for help in putting away the sinful behaviors of the old man. I desired to commune with others who, had, who also had the same longing in their souls. And I thought for sure I would find them in this church. 
As with all babies, there comes a time to wean the babe of Christ off milk and onto more solid food, food that satisfies longer and proves more beneficial for their next stage of growth. I had been fed with milk and was hoping others would see that I desired meat, but the milk kept coming. Now there is nothing wrong with the sincere milk of the word. It is needed and serves a purpose, but in order for a babe of Christ to go on to perfection or maturity or completeness, he needs meat. He needs more than the preaching about God's grace or God's love or resurrection or eternal judgment, but how to live as a child of God, how to love him, how to obey his commandments, how to love others, serve them, how to lay aside every weight that so easily entangles, how to forgive and extend forgiveness, how to turn the other cheek, how to allow yourself to be wronged instead of wronging others, how to be separate from the world, just to name a few. In time, I started to see that things bothered my conscience. I started seeing things that bothered my conscience. It caused me to wonder if those in my church did not love Christ or want to take his word seriously. I wondered why did they not do what the Bible was teaching in some areas. I wondered why that they seemed to take a soft line on sin and avoid talking about it publicly. I wondered why some seemed to be heading into the world that I was so desperate, desperate to separate myself from. I wondered what was wrong. Had God let them down in some way? Did they not remember how they felt the day they asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins and the sin burden rolled away? I was unable to find satisfactory answers for most of these questions, but the one thing I was sure of was that our paths were diverging. After many talks and meetings and much prayer, the time came for me to find another body of believers who could help me become the mature man in Christ I desired to be. The decision to leave did not come lightly. I was leaving the church that nurtured me as a babe in Christ. My wife was leaving the church she grew up in and the church her parents continued to worship in. We were agreed in our decision to leave, but our, I, our reasons were not identical. However, both sets of reasons were acceptable to each one of us to conclude that a break with our church was necessary. After only two Sundays of visiting other churches like the one we had just left, we concluded they were probably not going to find what we needed in these types of churches. Yes, these churches were larger and had more programs and preached the Word of God, but they still presented problems of the conscience that we were looking to flee. The following Sunday, we visited a brethren church in Brunswick, Maine, and have been regularly attending since. It didn't take long for us to realize that we had found what we were looking for. We continued to appreciate the sincere and simple approach to God's Word and the literal observance of the doctrines taught in the New Testament at this church. Life Principles in Worldview So what can we glean from the first half of my life without Jesus? What principles guided me during my life without Jesus? What was my worldview growing up, not knowing Jesus? What went through my mind as a child, as a teenager, and young adult trying to make sense of life, not knowing Jesus and his principles? Child, thinking, thinking as a child, some of what went through my mind as a child is probably the same as most children. I hope that we have what we need. I hope I can have fun. I hope I make my parents proud. And there were some things going through my mind that others probably didn't think about. By age 10, I would, I would have been doing a lot of laundry, cleaning the house, and cooking food for my brothers and I. This was not normal among my peers, but this was necessary to my mother's hangovers and time spent away from the home. Some of the questions I considered were, will I have clean clothes to go to school in? How do I cook? How do I clean? Thankfully, my mother did teach me those things. By age 12, I would have been aware of my mother's drug and alcohol addictions, which led me to wondering, will my mother get home safely? And Ernest talked about this a little bit with this woman he had been discipling. At age 12, I became aware that I lived in a dysfunctional home. I learned this in one of my classes in middle school. Up to this point, I thought our home life was normal. I hoped others didn't know our home life was dysfunctional. 
As a child, we were taught personal responsibility to pick up after ourselves, to take care of our things. I accepted that I needed to take care of my stuff and that no one else would have to do that for me. We were disciplined. Family life was not devoid of the check on behavior and of meeting of expectations. Some of the things going through my mind as a teenager, I want to play sports as much as I can. That brought a sense of fulfillment, sense of joy, sense of peace, acceptance. I wanted to play to do that as much as I could. I also had brief thoughts of playing in the major leagues, which that does not happen for most people. How do I get a girlfriend? Does my mom love me? It sure doesn't seem like she does. Will my mom make it home safely tonight? What do other kids at school think of me and our family? How do I satisfy my father? My father had very high expectations, almost perfection in sports and in school. I turned his dissatisfaction into motivation to make improvements where I could. But my brothers did not channel this to motivate them. They took the mindset of, he's not going to be happy no matter what I do. Therefore, I'm not going to try any harder. Also went through my mind is, will we have what we need? Will we have enough food? Will we have to move again? Will there be enough gas in the car to get to where we are going? Will we get new clothes? Will Dad provide these things for us? And I thought it was my dad's job, my dad's job, my dad's job only to provide for us. I did not try to make sense of things in my home life until I was in high school. However, I don't think I realized what was going on until after college in my mid-20s. However, in high school, I did not feel as though I was a victim. I didn't ask, why is this happening to me? I didn't think, I don't deserve this. I didn't wonder, why, and then insert the name of some deity, allowing this to happen to me. What was happening was a consequence of the choices my mother and father had made over the years. Nothing more, nothing left, less. It wasn't my fault or my brother's fault. Some personal principles that we grew up with, that I grew up with. Personal responsibility. You work for what you needed or wanted, and you didn't expect that others would just give, it, give you what you needed. A work ethic. We were taught a good work ethic. Show up on time, work the whole time, do what you were told, have a good attitude. Integrity. Do what you know to be right, even when you know no one else will find out or no one else sees what you were doing. Don't cut corners. Don't take shortcuts. The results will always be better if you do all of what's asked of you. Money management. There was no instruction in the home concerning money management or saving and planning for the future. I don't think my father was against this, but my mother only lived in the moment. What was witnessed in the home was living paycheck to paycheck, and I think that that's all my parents could do. We had what we needed, even though it didn't seem like it at times. And I am thankful for this. I'm thankful that my father was able to work. I don't think he was ever out of, out of work. In all the years that he worked, he was always healthy and could provide. So I'm very thankful for that. Paying bills was part of your responsibility, and they needed to be paid. Credit cards were used to pay for other necessities once the paycheck was spent on bills, rent, food. And this seemed normal. Taking out loans for vehicles was normal and seemed to be the only way to do it. Money management and running a household from a financial standpoint was taught in high school. I remember being very grateful for this instruction and put it into practice immediately with a little bit amount of money that I had to manage. Personal justice or a sense of right and wrong. I grew up with a functioning conscience and I did allow it to work. It was not a redeemed or cleansed conscience, but it did put a check on my bad behavior. There were things that I knew to be wrong and were taught were wrong from a social or cultural perspective and did avoid those at times. I remember telling on myself when I was a child for doing something wrong, getting away with it, but then telling on myself because I didn't feel like it was right for me to have gotten away with something. Consequences followed actions. You break the rules. Punishment was expected and given. There were no excuses for poor performance. Neither others nor circumstances were to blame for your poor performance, including my home life. It's not fair. 
is not something we said in our home. It's not fair. It's not something we said in our home. Whatever happens has happened has nothing to do with fairness. It's just how things worked out and we needed to deal with it. Pay attention to what you're doing and don't worry about what others are doing. No self-pity. If something or someone knocks you down, get back up and keep going. I knew no concept of sin as God teaches. The wrong I did was to other people and their rules or to their rules or their stuff. I was responsible to them and them alone to make it right. My wrongdoing was between me and the one wronged, and the only third party offended or upset would have been my parents. There was no deity that was wronged or offended to whom I needed to ask forgiveness. Worldview. Origins of life. I was taught there was a cause for every effect, and that all causes are due to some natural cause, some natural occurrence. Everything was explained from a naturalistic worldview, and the supernatural did not exist except for on TV or in video games. Evolution and the Big Bang would have been the only theories and explanations given for the origins of life. I recall no other theory or explanation given until I was in college. However, a blatant disregard for human life or viewing mankind as merely higher functioning animals was not the ideas taught or practiced in my community. Death or afterlife. I don't remember having any real thoughts about life after death. Heaven wasn't real to me, but I did understand that it was meant to represent something good. There is no understanding of sin, therefore no understanding of being lost, and so there was no need to be saved from eternal death. I did not operate on a works-based salvation system. I didn't even know something like that existed until after I became a Christian. Justice. There are consequences for actions, break the laws, and you go to jail or pay a fine. Defending yourself is encouraged and needful. You are viewed as weak and neglectful to your family if you don't defend yourselves or them. Good guys should win and bad guys should lose. America is the good guy and everyone not doing what America says is the bad guy. War is not wrong because we are the good guys defending the innocent and taking out the bad guys. Citizenship. We were taught to be a good citizen. Follow the laws, work hard, pay your bills, pay your taxes, vote, etc. We were taught to be generous and to help others and not worry about material things. Helping and caring for others was encouraged and practiced by my mother and my father. This was not done to earn points with some god or any higher power. Nor was this done to cancel out something that we had done. We, didn't under, we wouldn't have practiced anything like that. We didn't know anything like that. This is simply done to help someone in a tough spot. Participation in war is expected and honorable. Higher powers. There was no mention of God or a higher power or anything like that in the home. We are responsible for what happens. We need to accept that and act accordingly. So these are my worldviews I grew up with. This is not what I believe now, just to be, just to be clear. There was no understanding of or desire to know God. As far as I knew, there was no God, but not in a someone told me about him and I didn't believe it way. The few times I attended Sunday school, I was too young to understand what I was, what I was being taught and there was no reinforcement and follow-up from my parents. I didn't know God and certainly didn't know Satan existed. Alternatively, I believed UFOs were real and I was mildly afraid of being abducted. Aliens were, without a doubt, more real to me than any god. Aliens were not supernatural in the sense that I think about it now. They were natural, just having a different nature than me. I didn't sense that I was out of favor with some god or missing out on blessings from the Christian god. Looking back, I believe we benefited from his goodness as described in Matthew 5, 45 in this way. He maketh his son to, to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and unjust. Things that Christians did that were helpful in coming to faith. I was given a Bible that was written in modern English. I studied Shakespeare and other works written in Middle English in high school, and that language seemed foreign, 
and reserved for times gone by. I don't know if I would have easily understood what was being described had I been, had I been reading it in 400-year-old English. That is not to say that I have any problem with the King James. That is what I, that's what I read. It's just at age 18, 19, I don't know if I would have understood what I was reading as well. That was not my language. I was encouraged to read the Gospel of John first. Jesus was the focus of the witness that I was receiving, and I probably would have been very confused with the Old Testament and how that relates to Jesus. Now, that is not to say that someone cannot start there witnessing from the Old Testament, work to the New Testament, and have that be just as successful. It's just not what happened in my case. So I'm not coming against that method at all. They shared the truth with meekness and fear. They did not try to get me to accept it through intimidation or ridicule, ridiculing my worldview. They pointed out holes in the worldview I had, but it was done with carefulness and with gentleness. They shared the truth as though they were not ashamed of it. They shared about sin and righteousness and judgment in a straightforward manner, without apologizing, apologizing for how harsh I might perceive it to be. I'm actually very, very thankful for that one fact, that they were very straightforward in presenting those things that are taught in Scripture. They walked the talk. I could tell that Jesus was real to them and that desired to serve Him. I did not perceive or witness behavior that was contrary to what they were sharing with me. By this, they maintained their credibility and I could trust what they were saying. They allowed my questioning to guide their witnessing. They did not follow their own script or execute their own agenda or were able to share what they needed to while addressing my questions. They did not shut down my line of questioning as though I were asking the wrong questions. They appeared to care about me. I say appeared because I don't know exactly what was in their heart, but they did appear to care for me. They showed genuine interest in my questions and my seeking attitude. I did not sense impatience from them or that I was a bother to them. They only gave me what I could handle. I could understand what they were talking about. They didn't use a bunch of theological terms or Christianese that I didn't understand. There was so much more that they could share with me, but there was only so much that I could understand without the indwelling spirit. And then lastly, they encouraged me to listen to Christian radio. This allowed me to hear the preaching of the word. They were sharing truth, but they weren't necessarily preaching or teaching to me. Conclusion. Perhaps you've heard this proverb, what parents do in moderation to children do in excess, or some form of that. There may be situations where this is true, but this is not a law. This is not what has to happen. Life principles can be rewritten, and worldviews can change. The gospel truth makes this possible. Sharing the gospel truth with others takes preparation. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart first. Make sure He is, has the highest place in your heart and mind. Make sure He is the one that you lean upon for help and the one you present to others. Be ready. Actually consider that this is something that will happen to share the gospel. Try to figure out what the other person is thinking and what guides their life. Try to put yourself in their situation. This can be really challenging if your backgrounds and experiences are vastly different. However, all people have the same basic needs. And these are good areas to make mental notes about or even write them down as you're talking to them. And as you do this, this may require multiple conversations and you will have to listen more than you talk to really hear what they are saying and understand their life. Rehearse what you would tell someone when they ask you for the hope that is in you. Think about answers to questions that you have been asked before. However, be willing to let their questions guide the conversation and then inject truth where you can. When the time comes, present the truth with meekness and fear or reverence for, the God, for God. How you present the truth is just as important as what you say. You're not just trying to put a notch on your belt for making a convert but you're trying to save a soul from death. There's a difference between the two, and it will show in your conversation and your ongoing relationship with them. Additionally and lastly, 
Present the truth as though you are not ashamed of it, like Paul declares in Romans 1.15. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Blessings on the rest of our sessions here.